Hello and welcome back to the life and suffering of Sir Bronze. Year 1134, no, 1140, Egmont's speech. Just a few days into the year, Mayor Egmont, chairman of the Lesser Quorum and owner of several silver mines, made a speech that caused quite a stir in the province. Though a commoner, Egmont had the gall to demand that the Magran authorities both enforce and obey imperial law. What's the use of the imperial laws if they aren't enforced as they should be? Even today, any any nobleman who gets up on the wrong side of the bed can draw his sword and run a commoner through with impunity. These gentlemen may be our rulers, but does that mean they can defy the Emperor's will? Sir Alborn has been appointed to enforce the rule of law in Magra. How come the Prefect doesn't see this? We commoners aren't trying to seize the noble lots and take over the province, but the rule of tradition is a thing of the past. This is the age of justice. We may not all be equal in its eyes, but even the nobles and clergy must obey the law. The Magran aristocracy is furious with Egmont and demands that he be silenced, but the rich industrialist has too much money and too many connections to be dealt with so easily. You hear more and more rumors about secret societies of commoners appearing in the city, plotting against noble rule. The gentry fears that Egmont and his peers might be behind this, but they have no proof, at least for now. Father Leonard, a bot of the Temple of the Silver Tree and leader of the New Believers, supports Egmont and has spoken publicly in his favor. The twins themselves entrusted the noble estate with the right to rule over the common folk. But rulers must also care for their subjects. The old faith is mistaken. No commoner should ever be forced to suffer. It is for this very reason that the imperial law exists. It is there to ease the people's suffering. May those laws be duly enforced and may they serve all the people of the empire. More struggle for power, people are discontent and the security has gone down. Okay. The Vassal and the Lord. It is another day at the prefecture. A secretary peeks into your office with a message from the prefect. There is a new case he wishes you to handle. You put away your quill and walk to Sir Elborn's office. To your surprise, he happens to have another visitor already. There is a graceful figure sitting across from your immediate superior, none other than Octavia Milanidas. After all the times you have met her in the capital, you expect the the Archduke's daughter to be brilliantly, lavishly dressed, but her appearance today is modest and formal, with a high neck dress and a strict bun. However, her demure attire only serves to emphasize her role as a distinguished visitor to the prefecture. You bow to the prefect and the noble Arcanian lady. Octavia offers you a curt greeting, then returns to the conversation you have interrupted. This matter can brook no delay, Baron Elborn. The young judge may well wait outside. Nonetheless, Sir Elborn insists that you come in and take a seat. Worry not, Brante, you aren't interrupting at all. Lady Milanidas, I was scheduled to meet with Sir Brante at this very hour. I regret to inform you that your visit was perhaps somewhat unfortunately timed. Octavia rises from the soft high back chair. The young Arcanian lady now stands tall, elegant and indignant. You are out of line, Sir Elborn. Archduke Melanidas has graced you with a, with a representative from his dynasty and you will listen to what I have to say this instant. The Archduke has expressed concern over your manner of governance at the prefecture. You have always been headstrong and eager to infringe upon the freedoms of our own noble estate, but now it appears you find it acceptable to conduct proceedings against our own loyal subjects. Our dynasty has already seen many loyal nobles of the sword arrested or faced with punishment in court. Where will this lead? Do you mean to enforce your lowly laws against us Arcnians? Do not forget that those laws were written to keep low-born humans in check. Our lives have always been governed by noble honor and tradition, as well as the blood tide that is our heritage. Our only justice is the court of honor. The only rule above us is that of our, own, of our sovereign, the emperor, and the twins. Our only duty is to our kin and our forefathers. My ancestor, Char Milanidas himself, granted the boon of nobility to you humans. It would be most unwise to make me regret his decision of old. In the name of Archduke Milanidas, I demand that you end any and all proceedings against our subjects at once. Sir Elborn acknowledges Lady Octavia's vehement speech with a calm smile and nothing else. He shows no trepidation, no tremor, nor fear, even though the lady across from him represents one of the Empire's mightiest dynasties. Lady Milanidas, the twins have graced the blessed Arcanian lineage with a boon of long life, yet the world can be quick to change at times. The laws of the Empire now govern the nobles of the mantle, and even the nobles of the sword, along with the common estate. This particular change is not as recent as it might seem. The laws of the Empire are the decrees of the Emperor himself. 
the twin's chosen supreme sovereign. His laws are his will, which is, as you said yourself, the only rule above us, and that means all of us, from a highborn Archean to the lowliest commoner. Presently, the Emperor's representative in our province is Overseer Gaius Tempest. Like this prefecture in its entirety, I am simply obeying the Overseer's will and the laws of the Empire. Then pray tell me, Baron Elborn, who is your own sovereign and protector? He is none other than my father, Archduke Melanidas. You swore him an oath of fealty and vassalage. It is your duty to follow his word and will. Or do you wish for the Archduke himself to address you directly? I tell you, cease this harassment of our loyal noble subjects at once. I will not leave until this order is carried out. Why, Lady Melanidas, I'm afraid this is quite impossible. As a servant of the Empire and Imperial Overseer Gaius Tempest, it is my duty to enforce the law. Now if you will excuse me, Sir Brant and I have urgent matters to discuss. The gaze of the Archduke's daughter is locked with the Prefects in a silent struggle. Each expects the other to back down first. But then Octavia suddenly turns toward you. But I believe the young judge has more in him than blind obedience. Surely you are able to distinguish a rightful claimant from a threat to your province, are you not? Silence resounds within the Prefect's office. They are both waiting for you to speak. Oh, we are absolutely defusing the situation. Yeah, 13. Yeah, we've got enough diplomacy as it is. You have Lady Octavia's attention now. She may not have shown it in Sir Alborn's presence, but she remembers you from the capital quite well. Skillfully, you take advantage of this connection to reduce the tension. You start by reaffirming her position. Truly, the Archduke has every right to look after his noble subjects. You would never expect an ancient dynasty to abandon the loyal nobles to their fate. Having said that, you shower the Archduke and his noble dynasty with praise, including his brilliant progeny who has designed to grace the Prefect's office with a visit. You casually mention your encounter with Lady Octavia at the fencing tournament in Eterna. I have to admit, Bronte, for a human you fought valiantly indeed. I've witnessed some of the best Archean swordmasters at work, and yet your fighting piqued my curiosity. There is a look of relief on Sir Elborn's face as he watches you converse. Still, you return to Octavia's demands. After all, she did not come here for a small talk. The Archduke's word, words carry great weight, but sadly, Sir Elborn has no power to, to decide the matter. After all, he is but a, herbal, a humble servant of the Emperor. Perhaps it would be more prudent to take this matter to the Emperor's overseer, Gaius Tempest who is also an Archean of noble lineage. Just like a moment ago, Octavia winces at the mention of Gaius Tempus. The Emperor's brother took away her noble family's right to represent imperial authority in the province of Magra. Still, the Archean lady considers your words well before speaking again. To a certain extent, you are right, Calamity Brante. I cannot help but admit it. We Archeans ought to avoid involving humans in matters of supreme authority. It is still my wish and intention that Sir Elborn present us with an answer, but if he absolutely must learn the will of Gaius Tempest beforehand, then so be it. But do not tarry too long with your answer, or you risk angering my father. Octavia rises elegantly from her seat. Before she leaves the Prefect's office, her eyes rest on you for a moment. She bats her eyes charmingly and addresses you with a gentle smile, and then she is gone. Alborn pats you on the shoulder, content with the outcome of the interview. Unbelievable. I never expected you to be acquainted with Octavia Milanidas. My thanks, Bronte. You bought me some time. If you hadn't intervened just now, I'd have had to defy the law and end all cases against nobles who serve the Archduke. We'll see what the Overseer says about this now. Archduke Milanidas is testing the Prefecture with his daughter. Otherwise, he'd have asked me to visit his palace personally. He's showing caution, which means we will stand strong, at least for now. We will continue our service to the law without regard for the outmoded ways of the past. But I digress. This is high politics and the Prefecture still has plenty of cases to revolve. Let's get to back to our work, shall we? We shall. With that, Elborn hands you a new case file. You thank the Baron and head back to your office to study it properly. It's time to get back to work. Alright, willpower slowly going down again. Passion. The repercussions of your most recent encounter with the Archduke's daughter Octavia soon manifest themselves. A letter bearing the seal of the great dynasty of Milanidas arrives the next day. Inside the envelope, you find an invitation to Castle Serpent Verda, the Archduke's residence. Visiting the Archduke of Magra himself is a great honor. To decline such an invitation would be an insult of colossal magnitude. 
You immediately purchase a new doublet in the latest fashion and ask father to lend you a precious family brooch. It depicts the Bronte family crest and the leaves on the oak branch are made of tiny emeralds. Octavia should find it to her liking. Your family cannot help but notice your preparations. Mother watches nervously as you make sure everything is ready for your journey. This odd invitation has me worried, my son. Be careful in the Archduke's, Archduke's castle. You're still of lowborn origin. Agni and attention spells danger to people like us every time. Remember not to displease them or the Milanidases will grind our family into dust. Come early morning, the carriage takes you away from the border walls of Anizot. It takes you a full day to reach Serpent Verda along the dusty, sun-scorched high road. While on the road, you read the notes on Archnian traditions and rules of etiquette again and again. To preserve your family's honor, you must make the best possible impression. The provincial powers that will be, that, that be will be watching your every step, and so will Octavia with her cunning grin. Only as the sun is about to set do you manage to spot the dark, colossal shape of Castle Serpenverda. A towering fortification of jet black stone spread across a peak looming over the bed of a long gone river. The carriage climbs the narrow serpentine road to the castle gate. Soldiers of the Archduke's guard approach you and you present them with the invitation. The guards eye you with suspicion but give the signal to open the gate. You are now inside the walls of the Archduke's castle. You had expected to see many carriages of other guests beyond the gate but the courtyard is strangely empty. The guards show you to a servant who guides you to a room reserved for guests and leaves you there to wait. The servant soon returns and you follow him through the dimly lit corridors of Serpent Verda, lavishly adorned with silver, emeralds and weapons of war. The castle is silent. There is no noise, no music. It seems completely uninhabited. The sound of your footsteps is smothered by the soft velvets beneath your feet. The servant stops in front of a pair of massive doors made of black wood. This is your destination, he gestures silently. You enter an enormous room, its walls covered in portraits and ancestral relics. In the very center of the room is a towering throne carved of black wood. Upon the throne you see the delicate silhouette of Octavia Milanidas, clad in a black velvet dress embroidered in silver. With a commanding gesture, the Arcanian lady bids you approach. You're here at last. Are you surprised, Calamity? How odd. You didn't think my father would actually summon you to an Arcanian castle, did you? Or are you truly that naive? How sweet of you. No, it was I who summoned you here. You are alone in the castle. Portraits cover the walls. Portraits of Arcanians with dark eyes and jet black hair. They all resemble birds of prey and their eyes seem to watch you with contempt that makes you uneasy. Allow me to introduce you to my family. Family? This is a human by the name of Bronte. What do you think of him, father? She casts a defiant glance at the portrait of the Archduke Milanidas. Then she removes the glove from her hand and casts it as well. It hits the great Archduke right in the nose. Octavia laughs at that and the tall walls and innumerable portraits echo her voice. Baffled, you ask Lady Milanidas why she has summoned you. Because you have caught my attention. I noticed you, even when you were somewhat younger than you are now. And then I started seeing you again and again. I've caught myself thinking about you quite often, and so I've decided that I wish to possess you. You will become my companion. Other humans will envy you, but no one will dare to cross you. My name will open any door you like. In return, you will satisfy my every whim, and I will do with you as I please. Octavia rises from the throne, the hem of her dress lifting up to reveal her elegant slender leg. You know the history of this throne, yes? My ancestor Char Milanidas used to sit here during the rebellion of Magra. Can you imagine that? Char Milanidas made decisions that transformed the entire empire all from this very seat. And now it's gathering dust in this vainglorious art gallery of my father's. Now come to me, human. Octavia waits for you to do her bidding. One does not argue with an Archean. Since the dawn of the empire, they have taken whatever they wanted. If you refuse Octavia, daughter to the Archduke of Margaret, you will insult her greatly. If you submit to this Arcanian woman, if you become her plaything, everyone will know you're in the good graces of Lady Milanidas herself. As a human, what more could you possibly dream of? You recall your chance encounters with her from the days of your youth to more recent times. What are your feelings for this exceptional Arcanian lady, and what does she truly want from you? If you're willing to enter into a perilous romance with Octavia, 
Perhaps you could do it on your own terms, returning her affections while keeping your honor. Would she defy all the traditions of old for you and recognize you as her equal, even if only in secret? Octavia arches her back, uh, yeah, on her father's throne and waits for you, her slender hand beckoning you closer. No. Maybe. Hmm. I've got both. Yeah. This is, this is what we're gonna go for. You give Octavia your answer, looking her straight in the eye. You have been loving her and you have been in love with her ever since you were young, enchanted by her beauty and grace, every chance encounter a treasured memory, and you know that this feeling is mutual. To you there is no greater honor than Lady Octavia's affection. But you cannot sacrifice your honor as a nobleman for the sake of this love. You do not mean this as an insult. On the contrary, Lady Melanidas is far superior to you. It is true. Yet you too are of the noble estate and you cannot accept humiliation even if you must face the full extent of the Milanidas' ire. You will reciprocate Octavia's affection not as an obedient plaything but as a man and a noble. Your impassioned speech ends and you steel yourself to face her wrath, but to your surprise Octavia seems lost in thought, her eyes downcast. Nobody denies me. I'm not used to this. You are a remarkable human indeed, Calamity Bronte. I have noticed this ever since we first met. Your words echo in my heart. You do not follow the usual rules. Any other man would have been groveling at my feet by now. Perhaps you can be my escape from this stifling, sickening world. So be it. I choose a human as my lover, and I care little for what the aristocracy of this twin's forsaken province has to say about it. I'll take this as far as I like. But you will be safer if our affair remains a secret to the world. Now come to me, my sweet human. You draw closer to Octavia on the throne. She reaches out for your face, caressing it gently and carefully as though touching a human for the first time. A moment passes and suddenly her arms wrap around your neck and her legs lock around your torso and she pulls, pulls you closer to her with all her might. You do not resist the Arcanine's assault. Her embrace leads you to the throne. So, how do you like the seat of the great Char Milanidas? Just a piece of wood, don't you agree? Uncomfortable too, but luckily it's spacious enough for the two of us. Octavia's ravenous lips find yours, as her hands free you from your fashionable attire. Her entire body is shivering with excitement. You caress her skin, tender and azure. You commit her to memory, studying her, trying to understand her. Octavia's eyes are dark as the star sky yeah, starless sky, sparkling with delight from your sweet transgression. But why does she seek this pleasure with you? Why would she humiliate her ancestors and her very dynasty by having an affair with a human? I mean, she's not all too fond of her ancestry by the way that she threw a glove at her, her father's portrait, don't you think? Seeing you preoccupied, Octavia gently pulls your head up by the chin. She kisses you passionately and her lips start moving down your half-naked body. Yeah, why, why are we half-naked anyway? Her in inhuman passion swallows you and overtakes you until the vast throne room of the Milanidas dynasty echoes with the last of her ecstatic moans. Then there is silence, safe for the sound of your heavy breathing. Octavia caresses your back slowly, then playfully pushes you off the throne. The Arcanians watch you from the portraits, their faces as dispassionate as ever. Octavia returns to your dawn, now wearing a modest black dress, her hair in a formal bun. It is time for you to leave, Calamity. The Archduke will return to the castle soon. I will visit and is off now and again. Several estates there belong to me. We will meet there, safe from prying eyes. You leave, Serpent Verda, with your head spinning and your heart racing. The day it takes to return to Anizot passes like a single moment. When your family asks you about your visit to the Archduke, you evade the question. From that day forth, your heart aches sweetly, yearning for Octav Octavia's letters. And when it is time for a brief tryst, the two of you disappear to one of her estates and give in to your secret passion. There are days when your love and your lovers seem to be an illusion, something gone forever, but soon another note arrives and the affair continues, only to be cut short again for an unknown time. You have stolen the heart of the most beautiful and highborn Arcanine Lady of Magra. Only one nagging thought casts a shadow on your love. What will be the price for this insolence? Yep. It's gonna be interesting. Our willpower is gone now. Alright. 
Starts as an affair. Brothers in Misery Your home has been much more peaceful for the last year. The fights between Stefan and Gloria are not as fierce now, but how long will this last? Your job takes up all your time. You see your parents and siblings less and less often. Sometimes you don't even know what they're doing while you deal with the constant stream of duties. This morning you head out on urgent business. You take one step out of the gate and run into a uniformed gendarme. Calamity Brante, your presence is requested at the prefecture dungeon. Taken aback, you ask what this is about. We have your brothers Nef Stefan and Nathan Brante in a cell. They were arrested last night at the Steiner's Inn. They asked us to send for you. The cells in the prefecture dungeon are cold and damp. The guards lead you to the bars and behind them you see Nathan huddled in the corner. Your younger brother is unshaven, more disheveled than usual and reeking of wine and filth. Near the cell you see Stefan grimly sitting in a chair. You guessed that the gendarmes thought it best not to put him in the same cell as his lowborn brother. Upon seeing you, Nathan lets out a whimper and Stefan cracks a bitter smile. The sheath on your brother's belt is empty. There you are at last, Calamity. Have a look at our younger brother. Yesterday he got drunk in the company of some dubious fellows. They are commoners, yet they dare to surrender to pleasure. They started a brawl, wrecked the inn and harassed the waitresses. As soon as I heard, I rushed to save this drunkard from shame. Nathan cowers into the corner, horror struck. I walked in and demanded that Nathan come with me, but his cronies wouldn't let him go. That's, that's not true. You just grabbed me by the collar and dragged me after you. You nearly suffocated me. Shut your mouth, Carr. So, brother, they seem to have some sort of sect. They all shouted defamations against the twin gods, and one of them grabbed me by the arm. I was forced to skewer this heretic with my sword. I hope a lesser death will teach him never to lay his filthy paws on a nobleman. He was just trying to talk to you, Stefan. Silence. Then the gendarmes barged in and here we are. I have been accused of an unlawful murder. Apparently the new laws allow killing a commoner only if he attacks first or wields a weapon. They say that in the event of an insult I'm supposed to file a complaint with the prefecture. So now they're going to seize my sword for a whole year. What a shame. And it's all your fault, Nathan. Stefan gives the bars a furious kick. Nathan covers his face with his hands in despair. Calamity, brother. You are our only hope. Get me my sword back and get us out of here. And fast. We have to bury this sordid affair as deep as we can before anyone finds out. Save our family for shame. Um, I could use my authority, but uh, take them to the Inquisition. Blackmail the judge. Um, we could ask father for help. You persuade the help head of the family to use his powers as judge. Or we can refuse to help. I mean, really. What I want to do is refuse because they're both f at fault for this. Like, get yourself out of your own mess. Uh, I'm not using my authority, fuck that. What's our relationship? Our relationship with Stefan is terrible already, isn't it? So I can't really afford... Um, where is he? Hmm? Or is that here? Yeah, I can't really afford to fall into his um, disliking anymore. I don't care about Nathan. I've got plus for you of him. Hmm. You know what? Father, do something about this. He tells Stefan that the only way to get them out of this mess is with Father's help. No calamity. Father must not know about this. If he gets involved, we won't be able to avoid dishonoring the family. You coldly reply that after this incident's disgrace is inevitable. All that remains is to try and minimize the damage. Leaving your brothers, you go upstairs to your father's office. Yeah, and it's your fault, Stefan. Remember this. What happened, calamity? You give father an account of the incident. He becomes more and more grim with every word you utter. Is this why I earned the judge's mantle? To get my own sons out of prison? I would have expected something like this from Nathan, but Stefan, I will not demean myself so that I can avoid their punishment. You argue that in this case the damage to your family's reputation will be far greater. Stefan will be publicly deprived of his sword and Nathan will be sentenced to hard labor on the streets. I hate to admit it, but you're right, son. I will have to swallow my pride and plead their case to the prefect. Stefan is his nephew, after all. Father gets an audience with his superior Elborn. He returns downhearted but holding the prefect's order. 
Together you walk down to the dungeon and present the order to the gendarmes. Stefan Brante's sword is to be returned at once. He has not broken the law and must be freed. As for Nathan Brante, you will personally cover the damages the inn has sustained. This is no reason to keep a son of a noble family behind bars. Oh no, we're losing even more wealth. Seeing the prefect seal, the gendarme nods obediently and returns Stefan's sword. Actually, it said he will personally cover. Or did it say I will personally cover? God damn it. Father, I know you I knew you'd come to the rescue. I haven't really done anything shameful. We will discuss this at home. Stefan sheaves his sword reverently as Nathan is let out of the cell. The elder brother takes the younger by the scruff of his neck and pulls him to the door. Nathan staggers and shuffles along limply. The prefecture is highly displeased with the indiscreet nepotism your father took advantage of. Unsavory rumors about the Brancy family creep through and is out. Back home, father lectures Stefan. Your elder brother objects and blames Nathan for everything. From now on, there will be no more drinking bouts or other nocturnal exploits, Nathan. Who are those rogues you've befriended anyway? Stop shaming this family. If you're so worthless, at least let others go about their business in peace. Do you understand, you blockhead? Nathan remains silent, staring despondently somewhere above him. Yeah. Modest. And disagreements. But manipulation has risen. That's good and not to... There wasn't a hit to our finances, so that's, I'm happy with that. More cases. The case of Father Mark. Your most recent year of service at the prefecture has seen an increase in litigation on crimes against the church. More and more people are joining the ranks of the new faith in Anizot. The movement began with destitute beggars who had nothing to lose, but for years now many well-off commoners and new nobles have been joining the fold. People say the leader of the new faith in Anizot is Father Leonard, the abbot of the temple at the Silver Tree. The city's leaders would love to expel him, but he's too highly regarded by the common folk. Complaints and cases of defiance of one's lot keep pouring in. Every day somebody is reported by their neighbors for heresy. Many commoners, adherents of the old faith, fear that such flagrant defiance of the Lord of the lots will usher in the prophesied wrath of the gods. Oops. However, you and the other judges have no choice but to reject most of these cases. As a secular institution, the prefecture has no authority when it comes to crimes against faith. Only the church and the inquisition have any say here. In the middle of another busy day at the prefecture office, the door suddenly swings open. A tall gendarme, wearing an officer's uniform, walks in. He takes off his helmet, adjusts his short fair hair and bows to you hastily. Captain Leonard reporting, Your Honor, my boys finally caught Father Mark, the dreaded apostate heretic. The prefect told us to take him to you for judgment. You, bring him in. Two gendarmes bring in a short, stout man, wearing a worn, dirty priest's cassock. Priests wear the sacred symbol of the twins, a cross within a circle, but this man does not. Forced to sit before you, this odd-looking priest is nonetheless strangely undisturbed by his arrest. His eyes, curious and glimmering with life, study you intently. This is him, Baba Mark in the flesh. We caught him trying to preach that teaching of his, smack in the middle of a drinking hall for the lowborn in the Grey District. Some guy took offense and we called for the gendarmes, and we got there right away. Father Mark, you've heard that name ever since you were a child. His cult of rejection of the twins has expanded tenfold over the past several years, with nobles, commoners and even other priests joining his flock. The Inquisition has hunted this heretical apostate for years, but Father Mark has always eluded capture, until now. Some say he has powerful protectors. Here are statements from people at the establishment, Your Honor. You flip through pages of handwritten statements. Father Mark isn't just preaching, he's openly defying not only the lots, but even the twins themselves. Father Mark teaches that the gods have neither design nor purpose for us, so we are under no obligation to serve them or prepare our souls for the hereafter. You put the papers away, ready to question the profane priest. What was the subject of his sermons? What was he trying to convince his listeners to do? Father Mark prefaces his answer with a dazzling smile. As a judge, it is your duty to enforce secular law. You know as well as I do that I've broken no such law. I am a priest, my friend, and in the empire priests are allowed to preach. I was preaching the proper way to live one's worldly life, for this is the only existence we have. I told my listeners not to waste their lives serving those gods. The twins surely love us, but alas, their love violates us as much as their law. This entire world is proof of that. I see my words upset you, but I'm afraid you can't judge me guilty for that. Here's why. 
You see, mine is the priestly lot. If the judgment of the church is to be trusted, which means that only the Inquisition Tribunal may find me guilty. So, you could hand me over to those black clad thugs, but alas, you will get absolutely nothing in return. The Inquisition wants to light their pyres in every corner of any zot, and all they need for that is me. As soon as they get me, the Inquisitors will tell the Prefecture to step aside and start enforcing the law themselves. Is that what you want, my friend? So what are you to do with me? Well, let's think about it. As a secular judge, you can't judge me guilty, but giving me to the Inquisition will weaken the Prefecture. And so, my friend, everybody will be better off if you just set me free. Trust an old philosopher. It's better for me, better for your Prefect and better for you as well. Surprisingly, the gendarme captain smiles knowingly at these words. He leans over and whispers a few words into your ear. You cannot help but notice the scars all over his neck. I say the old heretic's right, Your Honor. If he's still got the priestly lot, he's the Inquisition's problem. It's too dangerous for the prefecture to meddle in churchly affairs. And strictly between you and me, if the reports I've been getting are to be trusted, this here Mark's been rubbing elbows with Patriarch Cassius himself. Letting him go might get us on his good side. And so Praetorak's a very wealthy man. But suddenly the captain's voice trails off as the door to your office opens without warning. There is a young woman at the door clothed in a black cassock and bearing the telltale silver seal of the Inquisition. I am Sister Jeanne, your honor. I serve the order of the Inquisition. That stern face, those piercing brown eyes, they seem somehow familiar. Of course, this is the young acolyte girl from the temple at the Silver Tree. The one you saw during that school visit. She's an inquisit inquisitor now. Your men did well to track down and arrest Father Mark. Splendid. We've been hunting this false preacher for a long time. As I'm sure you know, priests may not be judged by secular laws, Your Honor. Mark has denigrated the twins and called for the people to reject them. He has broken his sacred vows and defied his lot. He will face the tribunal of the Inquisition for his transgressions. The man before you is a great threat to the people of Anizot, Judge Bronte. His words lead people astray. His speeches doom them to eternal suffering at the foot of the pillar. Only the church knows the way to end his heresy. You will hand Ma Father Mark over to me at once. Sister John remains in the doorway, wordlessly refusing to leave the prefecture without the captured heretic. The gendarmes and the captain stand still, awaiting your orders. Father Mark is lounging in the chair, enjoying himself and eyeing you curiously, waiting for your decision on this contentious situation. We can't set him free, because we're not scheming enough. We cannot prosecute the case with the Inquisition, because we have no theology. Mm. We can only either hand him over to the Inquisition or judge him ourselves. Um, you know what, we're just going to hand him over. I do not care too much about this person, and I hope this will bring back some of our willpower. For a while you consider op your options, then you get up from your chair and give the gendarmes a sign. They obediently lead him to Sister Jeanne. She allows herself the luxury of a brief smile. Thank you for being so sensible, Your Honor. I knew you had great potential ever since we first met. Rest assured, Father Mark will never break another law, whether sacred or secular. Now his sycophants will be able to hide from us no longer, thanks to you. If you ask me, it's all thanks to you, Your Honor. Not that there's any difference, though, if you think about it. You're just a puppet of the alien will of the gods, same as the rest of us. The gendarmes unceremoniously stuff a gag in Father Mark's mouth to protect you from his heretical notions. Sister Jeanne takes the apostate away to the dungeons of the Inquisition for his long overdue punishment. You soon received new reports. Interrogation and torture yielded the Inquisition the names of several of Father Mark's followers, all of whom were caught quickly. The pyres light up on the streets of Anizot. Imperial law has no power here, for judging heretics is the domain of the Inquisition. As Prophet Isatius teaches, the earthly, remain, uh, the earthly must remain upon the earth, the heavenly in heaven. The prefecture's duty is to enforce the law upon the earth. The laws of heaven are beyond the scope of your authority. And so you say a prayer to the younger twin. You are filled with the power of law you serve, so intense it is almost overwhelming. The law is one of the three manifestations of the twins. The law is your calling. Alright, we're going back to the old faith. Fighting less for justice. I mean, what do you mean? I guess, yeah. But I mean, it's not our right to judge that. I've increased in theology, not that I really care about that. But we've, 
we've successfully survived another year and that's going to be oh the road to the top this event is a consequence of your previous actions all right career over five and have not been branded by dishonor all right but that is where we're going to stop this episode i hope you enjoyed watching it and i'll see you guys next time bye